Evening, friends. Thank you for continuing to journey with us on a conversation about confidence. Uh, it's great that you're here to discuss and in invest in your own growth and in your own confidence. That's the plan, right? We're all, as a community, hoping, as a family, hoping to become more confident, maybe to get our confidence back. Um, and it was a great joy to be able to preach in Florida Road this last week on that topic. Uh, in last week's life group, you guys would have been discussing the really important question of how, how confident do you feel in God? Uh, I hope you were able to be vulnerable about that and really engage with that question. When I think about how confident I feel in God, there isn't a simple answer. I don't think it's kind of binary. Yes, I'm confident in him. No, I'm not. You know, I'm confident in him in some areas of my life. In other areas, if I'm really dead honest, uh, I don't know how certain I feel that God will come through for me in the ways I really want him to come through for me. And it's good to wrestle that stuff through um, and to discuss it. What we spoke about on Sunday past was the fact that that Jeremiah scripture that this whole sermon series is kind of hinging on, that blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, puts these two ideas together. Uh, your trust in God, your reliance on God, your confidence in him. But then it kind of speaks about your confidence, your, just your normal, everyday, garden variety confidence, the confidence you feel. Um, maybe partly in God, maybe partly in yourself to walk into every scenario you find during the course of a day. It takes a great deal of confidence to sell yourself to the world every day. It takes a great deal of confidence to attempt to reconcile where there is broken relationship, particularly if you're the one that did something wrong or everything wrong. It takes a great deal of confidence to take on injustice in the world or to try to build something beautiful or create something wonderful. It takes a great deal of confidence to do most of the wonderful things we long to do and that God has put it in our hearts to do. Uh, and so our confidence levels are pretty important and they're all, if we're honest, a little shaky. Um, possibly as a result of the last thing we've all gone through in the world or maybe for unique reasons to you, your confidence may be shaken. Um, it was really interesting for me in preparing for that sermon to start to dive into these concepts like confidence or hope or courage or trust, all of these words, which have right in the center of them this kind of weakness that's important, right? So trust is a beautiful thing. It has a weakness in the center of it because trust is not the same as knowing for sure. Trusting implies that there is some uncertainty, right? Courage implies that there is something scary there. You're admitting that there's something scary if you're saying you're going to be brave. It's not the absence of fear. It's the response to, to fear. Uh, we spoke about how hope is the same. It's like super powerful, but also super fragile. And confidence friends, is a bit like that as well. Confidence is not the same as certainty. So in a moment, I'm about to ask you to think about how confident you feel right now. Not in God, not in other things, just as a person, as a son, as a daughter, how confident do you feel right now? But it's really important, really important in life that we all start to wrap our heads around the fact that, that things are not quite so simple as I'm either breezing through it or it sucks. I'm either winning or I'm losing. I'm either sure or I have no faith at all. I'm either radically confident or I'm completely in despair. It's not so simple as that. And that all of us, as we grow in God and in ourselves, have to wrestle with the fact that it's okay to limp. It's okay to, to keep moving forward. It's sometimes even okay, the Bible says, to just stand. Even if you don't have the strength to move forward, don't bail, just stand. Right? It's a bit confusing. I'm, I'm Sorrowful yet always rejoicing, says the Apostle Paul. I quoted that on Sunday. And so it's all right for you to have a mixture of feelings when it comes to your own confidence. It's all right for you to say, in some areas of my life, I'm really confident. In other areas of my life, I feel really insecure. In some areas, I have been taking so many hits, and yet for some reason, I do still feel some confidence to kind of trudge forward. It's okay. You can be honest about that stuff. We don't have to have these simple binary, it's brilliant or it sucks kind of answers. And much of life, much of the most beautiful parts of life happen in that weird mixture, that in-between space where it's kind of beautiful and it's kind of dreadful and it's kind of amazing and strong and it's also weak. And that is the state of much of our lives. And so the first question for you to wrestle with and to discuss as vulnerably as you can with your group is just how confident do you feel right now? There's a great story in the Old Testament um, of God doing some realigning of someone's perspectives and attention and assumptions 
in order to help them get their confidence back and get back on board with the story, the beautiful, victorious story that God is telling in human history. And it's the moment when Samuel has to appoint Israel's second king. The first king of Israel, a guy called Saul, looked brilliant at first. He was everyone's favorite, and yet it all went horribly wrong. And Samuel now has the opportunity as the prophet, as the man of God, to anoint Saul's successor. The awkward fact is that Saul is still alive and not very keen to give up the throne. But despite that, God gives Samuel this instruction. Um, and Samuel is not feeling very confident at the moment when God starts speaking to him about going to anoint a new king. Samuel can see all the ways that things have gone wrong, all his own frailty, the frailty of his people, the hopelessness of the story that he thinks he's in. The world looks bleak to him and corrupt, and the leaders don't seem very trustworthy. Saul in particular seems like, like a busted flush, like a, just a bad situation that they're in. And God eventually has to shake Saul a little bit with the following line. He says, now, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, um, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Friends, one of the questions we all have to wrestle with is how long do we want to reserve the right to continue to mourn something when God is actually saying there's something new to get on with? My confidence may have been shaken by that failure. My confidence may have been shaken by that blow. And at some point, your loving, sympathetic father who wept with you, who cares, who knows, does need to have the right to interrupt your mourning and say, how long are you going to keep mourning about that? How long am I going to keep on relitigating in my mind how unjust that was or unfair or how anyone else would have been broken by it and God should be grateful I'm even standing afterwards? At some point, God wants to get you back on board with the victorious story he's telling in human history. And so this may be just a question for us. How long will you mourn that failed business, that failed venture, that failed marriage, that failed ministry, that failed day, that failed year, because God wants you to fill your horn to go and anoint something new, to take responsibility, to be victorious again, to start being confident and being a bringer of confidence, even though nothing yet has changed. He possibly wants you to be the agent of change, because that's what goes on. Uh, you may know the story that Samuel then goes off to Jesse, looks at all of Jesse's sons, and initially it's the same story. There's some that look really impressive, tall, kind of leaders of men type characters. But this time, God says, no, I'm not interested in any of them. And you may know that King David is the one that gets found, but he's the little urchin who's off watching the sheep at that stage. But when he's brought forward and no one is expecting him to be the solution, God says to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I've refused him. So Samuel's busy making the case to God about some of these other impressive looking guys. And it says, the Lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's great news for us, but I want to shift that question slightly. If you are Samuel in this story, needing to regain your confidence, maybe God is grabbing you saying, look, how long are you going to mourn for that thing? As you look at your own life, as you look at the lives of people you've relied on, I don't know what it is. How long are you going to mourn? Because you're looking at things the way the world looks at them. God looks at things differently. There is some new story, some new thing bubbling up that God wants you to be an agent of change in. And I don't say that glibly. I, I, those are not just empty words. At all times, the people of God are called to be part of the new, amazing, glorious thing that God is doing. Even in the mixture, even in the pain, even in the sort of, oh, I'm still struggling with my own lack of confidence. God is so bold as to ask you to be an agent of change. So the second question for you guys to wrestle with this evening is what in your world or in your own life are you currently looking at the way the world looks at it? But God wants you to look at it the way he looks at it and see the possibilities and potential that he sees. What do you need to look at differently from here on?